Hello and welcome to 2018 Guidelines Update, Changes to Keep Pace with Clinical Practices, one of 10 webinars hosted by the Facility Guidelines Institute on the 2018 Guidelines for Design and Construction Documents. I'm Heather Livingston, Director of Operations for FGI and Managing Editor of the 2022 edition of the Guidelines, and I will be your moderator during today's webinar. FGI is pleased to host this series of continuing education webinars developed to broaden understanding of the guidelines documents, the revision process, and to highlight key changes in the current edition of the guidelines. To obtain AIA credit, you will need to coordinate with the person who registered your organization on MADCAD. That person will be receiving follow-up directions by email. Each attendee seeking AIA learning units must complete a 10-question quiz on the content of this webinar in order to receive AIA continuing education credit. The views and opinions expressed during today's presentation are those of the presenters and may not represent the official position of FGI nor the HGRC. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Doug Erickson is the CEO of the Facility Guidelines Institute, a not-for-profit organization responsible for producing the guidelines for design and construction, and whose mission is to produce consensus-based standards in healthcare. He is a founding board member of FGI and has had a leadership position with the guidelines since 1985 and has been a committee member since 1978. Doug was the chair of the HGRC for the 2018, 2014, and 2010 editions and vice chair of the 1997 I'm sorry, 1987, 1992, 93, 96, 97, 2001, and 2006 editions. Dana Swenson is Senior Vice President and Chief Facilities Officer for UMass Memorial Healthcare. He is responsible for all construction, space planning, real estate, plan operations, public safety, environmental health and safety, food services, and housekeeping for the UMass Memorial Health System flagship medical center campuses. Dana was previously Vice President of Facilities at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston and Director of Patient Care Facilities at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. He's a leader in the healthcare industry and an advocate for maintaining the FGI guidelines as a vital fundamental standard of care for the planning and design of the healthcare built environment. Dana has been a member of the HGRC since 2001 and is a member of FGI's Board of Directors. Thank you both so much for being here and welcome. Thanks, Heather. Uh, to kick us off, I would like to start with a little bit about our committee and the type of professionals that are on the Health Guidelines Revision Committee. We have a robust committee of approximately 110 to 120 professionals that work in some aspect of healthcare. One thing that makes us different from other standards writing organizations is we do not include manufacturers or product vendors on the Health Guidelines Revision Committee. This was done intentionally so that all the effort of the committee was focused on developing fundamental requirements that will benefit the role of the facilities in providing a positive patient experience, increased safety, and quality outcomes. Manufacturers are given the opportunity to put in proposals and comments, and also to participate on focus and topic groups. As you can see, the HGRC is made up of a very diverse group of professionals. One of our goals is to have a representative from every organization that enforces the guidelines on the revision committee. This allows the state authorities having jurisdictions, the opportunity to participate in the development process and to hear the rationale on why a standard was written the way it was, and this will hopefully assist in getting more consistent enforcement from state to state. FGI looks at itself as a consumer reports organization, more so than a typical code or standards development organization. Our guidelines are written in code language, so they are easily adopted and enforced by state, federal, and accrediting organizations. Our guidelines are not the Ten Commandments, however, and sometimes need to be modified to fit the type of healthcare being delivered. By having a multidisciplinary committee, it has a great influence on the final results. Many times, as an actual practice, the designers don't agree with the clinician, who doesn't agree with the executive suite or with the enforcing authority, well, you get the picture. We make every effort 
to base the requirements on solid evidence where it is, where it is available. When evidence or research is not available, the process allows for heavy debate and standards based on the experience of the 110, 120 person HGRC. Thousands of professional hours go into developing each edition of the guidelines, and it is the collective experience that makes for good standards. Designers and users must be aware of the fact that many editions of the guidelines are still being used by state authorities. The guidelines are updated every four years, but many jurisdictions don't automatically update their reference, so they could be two or even three editions behind the current edition. We have updated our state adoption map to include very specific language on how state, states adopt or reference our guidelines. Our website, you will find, on our website, I should say, you will find an interactive map, and by dragging your cursor over the state, it will provide you with information about the use of the guidelines in that state. Every state is different, so it is very important to check the map and also check with the state enforcing authority to make sure that you are following the correct edition of the guidelines when doing your design. So thank you, Doug. That's a, that's a great background to this. And I think one of the other uh, key components to the guidelines is the term minimum standards. And uh, we struggle sometimes with defining minimums, uh, but at its very core, um, we, we, the guidelines review committee and, and then the steering committee and the board as well, look at the guidelines as a basic, a fundamental requirement uh, that can be applied across any organization, regardless of size. Um, and that's one of the, the components that does make it a little more difficult so that you can uh, uh, apply and well, as I already said, across different size organizations from the 700 bed hospital down to the 30 bed community hospital, and as well as some of the other uh, other healthcare settings that we're gonna discuss a little bit later in a few, few more slides. One of the other key items is that these are not best practices. These are not the nice to have. These are, uh, these are the minimums. Now we are working to move away from the term minimum because that seems to have, and it actually does have a negative connotation uh, for many people who think that we really are beyond something that's beyond a minimum. And so we're using much more the fundamental term. Since it is difficult to define, we do, um, we do spend a lot of time as a committee debating that requirement and uh, um, the cost implications, the safety implications, uh, and sometimes we were even pushed the envelope a little bit. Uh, when we made the decision that uh, from, a, from the point of view of patient safety and experience and outcomes that all new patient rooms would be single med, or all the med surge patient rooms would all be single occupancy. Um, you know, that was at the time it was pushing, but it's starting to bear out both through literature uh, review and uh, and anecdotally in some cases, but the impact of having private rooms is really uh, having a positive impact on the healthcare environment. Now, there are still some opportunities to design semi-private rooms, uh, but that is the individual organization has to define it in their functional program, present it to the state and the authority, authorities having jurisdiction, and then they can make that decision as well. The guidelines are for new construction and major renovations, um, we do try to define the difference between major and minor so that it's, it gets, if I'm doing a major renovation, then am I, am I starting to push into that new construction versus a minor? And so the, the authority of having jurisdiction have interest in that and we try to help with that, but they are the final call. Uh, and that's you know, pretty much how we move forward with that. As we look at these basic goals, um, you can see that unlike, and Doug touched upon this previously, unlike many other organizations, the individuals who are assigned are expected to speak on their own behalf and on behalf of their organization, but they cannot come in with a pre preconceived vote, pre-instructed vote from any organization. They have to use their own experience and expertise um, to help, help uh, 
to find to help in the conversation, help to find the issues, um, and then there are numerous opportunities throughout the process, and it is a it is a four-year process to uh, to reject, to accept, and to modify existing or or if there's a proposal for new language. In addition, there is an appendix in the guidelines. The appendix is designed to be more explanatory in nature. Uh, it doesn't re have additional requirements. It's it's not enforceable by regulatory agencies. That's why we've purposely pulled it out to put it in the in the back or in some cases, depending on which edition, it's more of a footnote. Uh, but it's more of an uh, it's more additional information. In some cases, it is best practices as well. Yeah, Dana, and uh, to continue on looking at the fundamentals and also uh, just the baseline, we also have what we call a benefit cost committee. And uh, the work of the Health Guidelines Revision Committee is consistently monitored by that committee. And where necessary, the overall results of accepting a proposal or comment may be influenced where the cost is high and the benefit is low. All committee members and other contributors uh, understand the complexities of healthcare organizations and work diligently to provide guidelines, requirements that provide a fundamental level of patient, staff, and visitor safety, along with the overall usability of the healthcare spaces, as you had mentioned before. With all of the rapid changes happening in healthcare and, and the healthcare environment, the final results of the 2018 hospital and outpatient guidelines for design and construction are truly fundamental. And as the report clearly defines, affordable for the additional benefits provided. So when you look at the chart up above or in the slide itself, you can see that uh, we have very, very small changes as far as the overall cost impact up against the benefits being provided. Uh, the new structure that we have, uh, which means that we're going to be doing a fundamental series of requirements and then a beyond fundamental series of requirements, will really assist in making that definition of what is an absolute requirement up against what is something that's nice to consider as you're doing your design. So as you look at the model, uh, you'll see that now we're going to split the document into two, as we said, fundamentals and beyond fundamentals. And uh, by doing so, I think it's going to allow us to provide a much better oh, um, series of background papers, such as uh, case studies and checklists, and um, even a handbook uh, eventually in order to explain what the uh, requirements are and why the requirements were written the way they were. Uh, and a, a great example of that, Doug, is, uh, is the issue of low acuity patient rooms uh, or low acuity patient stations in the emergency department. Uh, uh, healthcare organizations are struggling right now in their emergency departments with volume. Um, you know, we show these pictures here what some of the, the some of the interim solutions have been by different organizations to try and deal with these patients that come in that may not have the the high level acuity that requires a, a private ED room uh, fully closed in and the, some more of these low acuity types um, types of settings. Uh, it's interesting, we don't have a slide here or a picture here that shows the patients that are lined up around the ED station because that's the, the reality of today in emergency departments. And so how do you, how do you maintain that privacy and that dignity of the patient provide them the level of care that they need uh, and have it in a, in a safe and uh, comfortable environment for them. So one of the, the topics that came up, and it was actually a proposal that um, did come in and, went, and the proposal in general was accepted by the Healthcare Guidelines Review Committee, but uh, is this, this low acuity pod. However, we didn't accept it because we could not reach consensus on the minimum dimensions of the pods. By that, you can, you can see on this next slide that um, we have some other models and possible configurations that designers have come up with, working with different owners. And um, you can see you know, it looks very high tech, uh, would be very welcoming and accommodating um, in various degrees, but what these these configurations 
don't show is what's the right size. And that was the, probably the, the biggest thing that we struggle with. Even if you start to get to whether, uh, whether it's 40 square feet or 52 and a half square feet, what's the arrangement? How does that fit? And do you have to also deal with patients of size? Uh, how do you accommodate that? Or visitors that are with them. I mean, all of these show an additional chair in the space. People typically don't show up in the emergency department alone. So how do you accommodate all that and what's the best fit? So that is one of those, those sections that, uh, that we are going to take on in, uh, I think, take on in more depth in the 2022. Uh, but in the interim, we have developed a, uh, a document, a beyond fundamental document that really increases the knowledge of the owners and the designers so that, and hopefully influencing the AHJs to look at some of these various designs and then um, seek waivers, variances, equivalencies, whatever's required to make this a better spot than having the, the stretchers out in the corridor as well. Great, Dana, thanks so much. Um, I'm sure that everybody on the webinar right now would like to see some of the major changes for 2018. Uh, one of the things that we did do is we split the document, uh, the hospital and the outpatient document into two separate guidelines. So now we have three, we have hospitals, we have outpatient, and we also have residential. Uh, the outpatient and the hospital are freestanding documents and they do not have cross references that go back and forth between the two. Some of the major topics and changes that we made um, are shown to you. I mean, from emergency preparedness all the way down to procedure and operating room and sizes of those ORs. Um, continuing, on, continuing on, looking at exam rooms and clearances all the way through down to sterile processing. So with that, I'll let Dana talk a little bit about the emergency preparedness. Thanks, Doug. So one of the um... One of the issues that, as an owner uh, or an owner's rep on the uh, on the guidelines committee, is one of the things we we try to emphasize is the uh, the guidelines are a design manual and not an operations manual. So we we try not to get into the operations side of things. However, uh, we do recognize that operations in general do affect design. So the form follows functions and there is a need for emergency preparedness, um, regarding, regardless of what your uh, your accreditation un unit is, whoever is doing that, uh, you do have some requirements to make sure that you are designing for emergency preparedness, resiliency, uh, and recovery, and that, that business continuity side of, of things. I mean, typically a, a hospital in a disaster environment um, they're the light on the hill. They're the ray of hope. It's the, it, it is the place that does have generators going, backups on water systems, backup electrical systems. Uh, so the, the hospital in its, in its role in the community and its functional program does define how they're going to operate. So we need to make sure that we're providing the design supports for that and starting just the very basics of do you shelter in place, and what is my continuity of service? Great, Dan. And one of the things that we're going to be doing is putting together a topic group to develop a beyond fundamental on the sheltering in place of resiliency and looking at what can we be offering as guidance to the design professionals and the owners uh, when it comes to hardening healthcare facilities. Well, one of those other major areas that we took on in the uh, in the latest guidelines in the 2018 guidelines is telemedicine uh, with more and more telemedicine being used um, throughout the healthcare environment uh, it was one of those areas where we really thought we had to provide a, um, a fundamental a baseline series of um, recommendations and requirements it's not as simple as just selecting a room and putting the equipment in a room you really have to pay attention to the environment itself things such as glare coming from outside windows, uh, lighting that uh, can uh, is render the patient's uh, skin tone and color. 
uh, at the correct uh, level. Uh, keeping noise and acoustics uh, at a level in which it's not being um, disturbing to either side, either the clinician side or the patient side. So the next photo is just a really good depiction of what a well-designed telemedicine room is like, the camera position. Um, you can see the uh, really great uh, window treatment, keeping down all glare. The paint color is very subdued. It is not uh, high colors, reds and greens and oranges that would uh, tend to be distracting. So uh, once again, it's all, it's all in the room setup and it's all about being able to get the quality um, of the uh, of the uh, service that is being provided. Uh, then we also did something. We um, have an accommodations of size uh, for patients, and uh, what we did was a use we used to call this bariatric and a bariatric patient, but now we're saying it's a patient of size because we're looking not only at the patient's overall weight, but the distribution, the height, etc. So another big challenge is how the facility is going to address how a person's size is accommodated all the way from really the parking lot when they show up to your healthcare organization, all the way through that uh, facility to wherever they're going to be either examined, treated, or housed overnight. Uh, we also are looking at addressing, of course, visitors of size because they also need proper accommodations. One thing that we did do for the 2000 and 18 document is we went ahead and did a simulation at Hill Rom. Uh, they were very kind to offer up their simulation lab to us. And we started to look at what we needed to have on the transfer side of that persons of size bed. And when you look at the two death, um, diagrams we have here, the one on the left-hand side is with the portable lift and it takes a lot more in the way of width in order to maneuver that portable lift with the patient in the lift from going from um, the bed to the toilet or bed into other services. When you have the actual uh, lifts that are installed permanently, the ceiling mounted lifts, as you can see here, you can do it in a five foot um, clearance up against a seven foot clearance for the portable. Both of these are included in the 2018 document, so it'll really depend upon if you want to continue to use portables or design for portables, or if you want to put in the um, permanently installed overhead lifts. And Doug, you, you mentioned it, but I think it, it bears repeating again. I, I think I even touched upon this a little bit in the uh, low acuity pods, that uh, we seem to focus on the patients of size, but we do need to also be considering the visitors, those who are with the patient, um, who may or may not be of size as well. And so that's a, it's a component that we're starting to recognize needs to be addressed even further uh, in, the, in the 2022 and beyond. Uh, moving on to the, the pre and post area, the, the PACU, pre-surgery, surgical areas. Uh, one of the things in the, in the 2018 guidelines that, is, that has changed is that uh, they, the combination of these spaces and being able to use the same space, looking at um, how I, how I, or how an organization moves the patient into the operating room and then brings it back out. Since we're using much of the same type of equipment, the same type of space, the staffing competencies are basically the same. That uh, in being able to reuse the space actually helps you maximize the efficiency of the space as well. Some organizations have, have been doing this already, their states have allowed, uh, but this really just starts to formalize it a bit more. A uh, couple of things to consider is the, uh, the visual privacy between pre and post. Uh, the patient about to go into the operating room may not want to see or actually wouldn't want to see someone just coming out of the OR. Um, besides the visual privacy in general as well, uh, the other component is the if you have uh, different restrictive requirements on the two spaces, it's it's whichever is the most restrictive uh, it shall apply to both spaces as well. Uh, this is also a good time for us to, to start to talk a little bit about some definitions or um, 
how, how things are defined or the nomenclature within the guidelines. So a bay within the guidelines is considered one hard wall and three soft walls. Now a hard wall you would typically think of as being the head wall, although that is not a requirement, but uh, it is certainly that's the, the thought process. Um, a cubicle is different. It would have three hard walls and one soft wall, and that's typically the soft wall is at the foot of the bed. Uh, so it's that, that kind of secluded uh, privacy wall to wall, but then you have the opening end with a curtain there. And then a room obviously is four hard walls uh, and a door into it. One of the, the key items with the, both the bay and the cubicle is the need for an eight foot clear aisle. So that can spill into the, the space at the, from the foot of the bed, but you have to maintain that eight foot clearance as well. And then I think uh, it's important that we, we get into some other definitions and a little bit of the glossary. So Doug, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the invasive procedures and things such as that. Thanks, Dana. One of those things that uh, over the past uh, 25, 30 years that I've been involved with the guidelines uh, that we continue to struggle with is the definition of invasive procedure. What is an invasive procedure? Uh, so we've uh, developed a definition within our glossary uh, that is not a medical definition, but it's a definition that will help the designer, the owner, and those folks that are trying to figure out what this healthcare facility needs as far as exam rooms, procedure rooms, and operating rooms. And um, it's, but it's not intended to be used as a performance uh, set of criteria. In other words, the guidelines not, is not going to tell the medical staff where to perform a particular service on a patient. That is a decision of the medical staff and not of the guidelines for design and construction. So this definition is really there to assist with defining uh, where we're going to be able to have um, certain procedures performed that are invasive and are not invasive. So on the next slide, you'll see that it doesn't, why it matters, the, it matters because um, if it's an invasive procedure, you have to perform it in an operating room. If it's a procedure that only requires sterile instruments and maybe some additional environmental controls, that would be conducted in a procedure room. And of course, non-invasive would be in exam rooms. We uh, used to try and define operating rooms, procedure rooms, and exam rooms using levels of anesthesia. We have gotten rid of that, and now it's really looking at the invasiveness of the procedure itself. So talking about procedures, along, Dana, operating rooms. So yeah, so along those lines and, and, and the operating rooms, it, it's, it's uh, interesting or important to note that um, we haven't changed the size of the ORs in, in the hospital setting. We haven't changed them um, in decades. Uh, the outpatients, we have changed slightly so that it went from a, from a baseline of 250 to 255 and uh, added, move that up to 270 square feet when general anesthesia is to be administered. And, and you'll see on the next slide how we arrived at that number. It's, uh, the, the key component here is that 48 square foot gray area towards the top of the graphic, uh, really recognizing that, uh, that the space for the equipment, uh, for the individuals uh, providing anesthesiology, really has an impact on, and then the, the flow around them as well has an impact on what that minimum size, that baseline size is. So the, this was developed using clinicians, um, using block diagrams, actually taking the size of standard pieces of equipment, putting them into a space and moving them around to, to arrive at what this should look like. And that then ensures that the anesthesiologist has enough room to perform their work at the head of the bed for the, or the head of the table for the patient. This applies, we're showing the example of the outpatient operating room, but it, but it's also the same, uh, same thought process and developed that also for the, uh, uh, for the inpatient standard hospital operating rooms as well. Then as we got into some more of the definitions, uh, and, 
and this goes to invasive procedure. We did struggle quite a bit with the, with the term, but the, if it's not meeting the, that definition, then these are items that can be done outside of the restricted space of surgery. So you may or may not require sterile instruments or supplies. There may be some environmental controls that are required based on the, the functional program, yeah, but it is, yeah, and, and there's some risk involved there as well. I'm going to touch upon that in just a moment. But the, uh, the environmental controls don't necessarily have to be at that OR level. This is similar to what used to be in, formally called the Class A operating space. When you're um, in a procedure room, it, it is a semi-restricted area. And access can be from either semi-restricted or the unrestricted, as it shows in the slide. Uh, 130 square feet for the clear area. Clearance is a pretty standard. Um, and then likewise, when general anesthesia is provided, we do want to provide some additional space at the head of that room uh, for the anesthesiologist. Great, Dana. Um, as you said, we use block diagrams on all of our major rooms, uh, working with the clinical staff, working with the architects, uh, working with those folks who are familiar with the environment, and whether they're um, a perioperative nurse, et cetera. So an endoscopy, by looking at the size of the room, as you can see here, we actually reduce the minimum or the fundamental baseline clear floor area down to 180 square feet versus the 200 square feet it was before. Uh, the other thing we've done is uh, really looking at the endoscope processing and uh, whether or not it needs to be a one-room concept or a two-room concept. So on the next slide, what you'll see is the fact that you could use either one or two rooms for uh, the processing of the endoscopes. Uh, you, if it's a one-room concept, really, uh, once again, from a ventilation standpoint, you could be moving air from the clean area into the decontamination area. You can see the placement of the sinks and uh, the flow going from the red arrow to the green arrow. When you're looking at the two-room concept, it's a little bit easier to um, set up from a mechanical standpoint because you do have a physical wall and a pass-through. Um, but once again, you're going from the red to the yellow to the green. So either one of those two rooms are acceptable as far as the guidelines for 2018. Then as we started to look at imaging and the classifications of operating rooms and the move of a lot of imaging into the more of the operating room settings. Uh, the committee worked on ways to address the, these different levels of imaging. So a class one image room, uh, this would be this would be your, your basic x-ray room or CT, uh, MRI. It's, it's, you're coming in for a diagnostic procedure, uh, some organizations even call it that, diagnostic imaging. So your, your ventilation controls are, uh, are basic, your accesses can be from the unrestricted corridor. Um, so th these are not meeting that invasive procedure uh, uh, classification. But then you start to move into uh, the class two imaging room. And these can be diagnostic, but th therapeutic as well. Uh, a couple of examples there, the uh, electrophysiology and endoscopy. Uh, you start to move from an unrestricted to a semi-restricted area. And uh, some of your controls, uh, depending on, again, the, the functional program, and this takes requires clinical input, organizational input, what types of procedures are being performed in these class two imaging rooms. And an example there for you know, cardiac cath, you may be changing some of your uh, some of your environmental requirements on the space, and then we really move into the, the class three room, and this starts to look at hybrid ORs. These could be biplane units. Um, it's truly an invasive procedure, and you do need to work with the clinicians, the owners work with the clinicians and the designers to determine what that risk is of. Uh, something happening that would require it to move to more of an open procedure. Yeah. Access on, on this, in these types of rooms, is from a semi-restricted area, so really are moving much more to that true operating room setting. And uh, so this is that, there's a jump between 
class two and class three uh, that needs to really be addressed, as I've said a couple times already, by or from a risk point of view. And then the, the, uh, the environmental controls having to meet those OR controls as well. If you're, if you're going to push that boundary, that's the more restrictive, and that's what you have to meet as well. One of the other things that we've been working on for a couple of cycles now is the whole issue of sterile processing. And this all started when uh, it, we uh, decided for the 2014 document, working with the uh, perioperative nursing organization to remove the requirement for substerile uh, rooms between operating rooms. Uh, you can still use the uh, satellite sterile processing if you'd like. However, um, the require, requirement for having one between two rooms is no longer there. So for the 2018 guidelines, uh, with the exception of a countertop immediate use steam sterilizer, all sterile processing, whether it is a satellite sterile processing unit in the operating room or the operating suite, I should say, or central sterile processing, have to have at least two separate rooms, one for decontamination and one for processing of equipment, cleaning, storage, etc. The change from a one room to a two room sterile processing facility applies as a minimum requirement. In other words, 90% um, of all of the sterile processing is going to be done in a two room setup versus a one room setup. However, as I said before, a smaller facility, uh, maybe an ambulatory surgical facility with a one OR or maybe an office based surgery or some other smaller type of ambulatory um, offerings could have a one um, a one room sterile processing unit. Uh, the next slide shows that one room unit, and once again, very difficult if you're trying to provide air moving from clean to dirty. Um, with the number, if you have more than one person in that room, the eddies that are set up, meaning the uh, different types of um, with movement from the staff. You're going to have air being mixed, uh, clean and dirty. So here again, very important that this only be applied to very small healthcare facilities and that the two-room setup is the one that you're going to be using up in the operating rooms if you are going to be putting in a satellite sterile processing unit or any place else where you, you actually need sterile processing. So moving on, Sam. Um specifically to the hospital guidelines. There are some other notable changes we want to touch upon, and we'll do that over these next few slides. But we're going to talk a little bit about movement to single bed CCU rooms, um, the sexual assault forensic exam room. You'll sometimes see that the acronym SAFE, the SAFE room, but that's the sexual assault forensic exam room. We're going to talk about that for a little bit. Um, geriatrics and the, the treatment of geriatrics in the emergency department, the the impact of IT, IS, and the technology distribution of rooms and their size. And then finally, uh, spend a little bit of time talking about mobile and, and transportable medical units as well. So the CCUs, uh, back in 2006, uh, the guidelines made the decision to go to private med surge rooms. We have now moved the CCUs to also be a private room single private room. So you see examples, many of us owners have uh, worked in environments in that the top photo, um, and the movement is, as the arrow shows, to go to the more private setting, um, almost a universal type of room, but it's, it's recognized that these critical care units uh, do require um, the, the need for a private room. So if you're doing a renovation, as the bullet points out, you can still uh, use cubicles. This would be one of those times where is this a major or a minor. So it may need to work with your AHJ on that as well to make sure that you meet those because that really would start to push the, the cost boundary as well. Uh, safe rooms, the, uh, the sexual assault forensic examination rooms, uh, quite a bit of discussion not on the need for them but on the location and the equipment within there Pretty standard, pretty much understood, but where should it be located uh, in the emergency department itself, the ED proper? Should it have a separate entrance? Is it permissible to have it on another adjoining floor? Uh, 
how do you balance the need for privacy and treatment? So it really does come down to the functional program, but, it, but there are some basic components that need to be provided and then really needs to, the organization needs to work with the designer to determine where does this best fit in the physical location as well. For geriatric patients, we are uh, really looking at and recognizing that, uh, that, that the bubble is coming through of boomers, that we're seeing more uh, chronic, elderly, geriatric patients. Uh, we need to deal with the surfaces and finishes on that. Uh, the requirements are different than, uh, than for different age groups. And, uh, contrast lighting and ways to reduce the patient falls. So there is a checklist, you see that on the left, for designing uh, geriatric treatment rooms in the emergency department, and uh, that, that's a, something that is a result of much of this discussion from the, from the guidelines committee. I mentioned that the, the changes in IT and technology. Uh, that previously, we'd put some square footage numbers in the guidelines. Uh, the problem is, in some ways, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, so different size organizations, uh, how do you establish a baseline, fundamental level of, uh, of design for these rooms? And the determination was to think of it more in line with electrical panels. So. Uh, it does require some quite a bit of discussion with uh, with the IT teams as to what size racks, where they're going to be, what the configurations are, and then maintain, maintaining three foot clearance around it. Now, as I said, it's, it's a difficult one because we don't know what we don't know. Uh, it, it's similar to years ago, we started to say we we would be going, doing away with paper completely in the hospital, and you wouldn't have desktop. Uh, they would need desktop computers. Well, we're seeing neither of those are working out yet. Doesn't mean they won't, but uh, we wanted to be able to give some basic guidelines, but leave the actual design component up to the individual organizations themselves working with their IT group. Speaking of technology, Doug, why don't you talk a little bit about the uh, the mobile and transport units? Yeah, Dana, before I do that, though, I just wanted to mention as far as the technology rooms are concerned, um, you know, as we move towards fiber optics, probably don't need as much space as we did with the with the CAT cabling. The other thing is we do have a low voltage beyond fundamental that is being worked on right now that will apply – that will really address a lot of these issues when it comes to technology. Yeah, as far as the uh, mobile and transportable medical units, um, did a lot of work on the chapter in both the hospital and the outpatient guidelines for 2018 version. Uh, as you can see, it really applies only to temporary facility uh, units. It's not applying any longer to the module or the relocatable units. Um, that's one of the major changes we did make. And also, it really uh, only applies for those that are not during a uh, civil uh, emergency or any kind of a catastrophe. Uh, one of the things that we did kick around was whether or not we wanted to put a time limit on when, how long these units could sit in your parking lot or sit up against the uh, healthcare facility itself. However, since we're not an operational document, uh, we decided to stay away from putting any kind of a length on how long that uh, piece of equipment could be sitting in your healthcare or, or near your healthcare organization. Excuse me. As far as the next is concerned, we did classify them. We got a class one, two, and three, very similar to what we did for the imaging um, uh, units. And uh, just a little bit about class one. A class one is really your uh, typical uh, mobile unit that's going to be brought in. It may have some exam rooms. It may have some screening facilities to it. And a class one unit can be sized and arranged to really just accommodate uh, the required equipment and, and clearances, but do not have to meet all of the clearances or clear floor areas of the guidelines. A class two unit, however, uh, shall make every effort to meet the clearances and the room dimension requirements within the guidelines. Um, where it physically cannot uh, be, just because of the size of the 
of the unit itself. Um, you can perform a safety risk assessment looking at the acuity of the patients being served and the type of procedures being provided. And then uh, once you've done that safety risk assessment, uh, working with the authority having jurisdiction to see if the, uh, the units are actually going to provide the safe level of patient care that's necessary in order to um, meet that demand. A class three unit uh, has to, once again, meet all the requirements for the clearances and the room dimensions within the guidelines. Moving on to outpatient guidelines, uh, very interesting. Um, when we split it apart uh, and gave it its own real true identity, um, what we were able to do in order to solidify and really firm up some of the requirements within the document. Uh, the one thing that I did mention is that you don't have to flip flop back and forth between hospital and uh, outpatient facilities. They are standalone documents. And they are also set up in the same fashion so that once you're used to looking at hospital or outpatient, the other one will be fairly intuitive. One of the things we did and one of the more notable changes we made was in writing a chapter that will provide flexibility for the design professional and also the owner where we don't have a very specific chapter that addresses the need, such as oncology or ambulatory surgery, or um, getting into some of the mobile transportable as we talked about. But this new approach uh, allows, as I said, the flexibility to really pick and choose among the different requirements within the 12 chapters we have within the ambulatory or the outpatient uh, document itself. I kind of call it um, lovingly the Frankenstein chapter, as it does permit you to kind of build uh, your own chapter on, uh, using all the basics and all of the other required material from the, um, the other 12 chapters within the outpatient facility. Uh, we do have a webinar that covers this in a little bit more detail. So once again, if you're interested, um, join that webinar and you'll get a little bit more information as to how to actually apply that quote unquote Frankenstein model. ASHRAE 170 is very interesting. Um, I don't know how many of you realize that uh, back in 2010, the guidelines really dropped um, the ventilation requirements from our standards and we partnered with ASHRAE and ASHI the American Society for Healthcare Engineering to develop a new standard 170, which is the ventilation of healthcare facilities. I think this was a really great move, and um, it's providing, in my mind, a lot more level of expertise from the ventilation engineers. Uh, ASHRAE 170 is what they call on continuous maintenance. That means that changes can be made uh, as they are are required to be made. In other words, a proposal can be put in at any time and then it goes through their process. It's not on a three-year cycle or a four-year cycle. Uh, one of the things that that does do, however, is it really uh, affects the adoption of 170 by state agencies because they typically have to adopt as of a given date and then cannot accept any changes beyond the date uh, that's in that public law and therefore, a lot of the addendum and the changes that take place subsequent to the adoption just uh, are not able to be enforced or put into play by the authority having jurisdiction. In the guidelines themselves, uh, we cleaned up our act um, as far as when 170 does or does not apply in an outpatient guideline setting. And so in the next slide, you'll see that the outpatient surgery and outpatient endoscopy shall comply fully with 170. Uh, and that would be the, once again, uh, the chapter on outpatient facilities. And then in table 8.1, you'll there's a lot of spaces that are listed there. And for any of those spaces that are listed in 8.1, when you're looking at imaging facilities of class two and three, infusion or dialysis, you're to be applying 170 for those spaces only. You would not have to apply it for waiting rooms and corridors and in other areas within that ambulatory care facility, but you would have to for the spaces that are listed. And then in the next slide, you'll see that for all of these other 
types of ambulatory care facilities, you do not have to apply 170 at all as far as the guidelines are concerned. Now, the authority having jurisdiction can do whatever they'd like to do when it comes to the application of 170, but from a guidelines perspective, we are just saying you follow local mechanical codes for those, um, those services that are listed there. And then, don't want to uh, short play the residential guidelines. Um, once again, uh, we have been updating these. The, um, 2014 was the first time that it was a separate document. So for 18, we continue to update it. And you can see how its availability. As far as the adoption of these guidelines, uh, it's really a mix and match type of a application. Uh, many authorities have in jurisdiction will not adopt the entire residential guidelines. They will adopt it by facility type. As you can see there, a good um, example is Connecticut uh, adopts it for hospice and for nursing home, but not for assisted living. So here again, it really uh, is imperative that you check with the state as you're doing these types of residential care facilities. Um, in 2010, 2014, we really started moving towards person-centered care. Um, big effort made in order to take these institutionalized type of settings that we had always put the elderly in in the past and move them into a much more uh, home-like and care environment in which the elders will actually thrive and not just feel as if they're being warehoused. Um, one of those, of course, nursing homes, looking at uh, the three different types of models we have, um, really putting more emphasis into the cluster in the neighborhood and the small house and the household type models uh, where people gather, cook, um, you know, they can cook meals together, they can uh, bake cakes, they can uh, sit and play cards. I mean, it really is much more of a home-like environment. As far as hospice is concerned, uh, we do have these seven different models. Um, here again, hospice is, it can be provided almost anywhere. Uh, once again, we set up some criteria for whether it's an uh, independent or assisted living based setting or whether it's an adult daycare. And um, we really try once again to provide the palliative care as uh, as well as we can within the types of facilities that are um, provided to handle this type of, um, of service. Assisted living, and uh, we've got a small, medium, large. Here again, more and more assisted living facilities are being regulated by the states. I think that it's uh, being looked at as part of that continuum of care. Therefore, the guidelines does address assisted living also. Independent living models are also provided. However, I don't think there's a state at this point in time that applies the independent living. That's the next slide, please. There you go, thank you. And uh, so it could be in a cottage setting, an attached house, but here again, um, states are not enforcing or not uh, adopting the residential uh, or the independent living model. We do have two new models for uh, 2018. One is long-term substance abuse, and the other one is the in, uh, for individuals with intellectual and or developmental disabilities. Both of these were requested uh, by, the, by state agencies where there were no guidelines uh, that they had available to them, so they asked us to put together these two new models, and we did that for 2018. I think you'll find they're going to be extremely well received by uh, authority sovereign jurisdiction as they do meet a demand that's out there in the residential community. So, Dana, what's new for um, 2022? So, yep, my thought was, uh, yeah, so, so what's next? And uh, What's next is the 2022 guidelines, and we've already started the process in the, in the development of the, uh, uh, the guidelines committee. Uh, we've identified that uh, we need to continue to provide quality standards and up, continue to update the, 
the hospital, the outpatient, and the residential documents, uh, we need to focus quite a bit on beyond fundamentals, beyond that baseline. What, what else can we do? So we we feel comfortable that we are uh, that we're we're moving around the edges a little bit now on the the basics, and so we need to start to move a little bit beyond the fun to beyond fundamentals. Some of those best practices. Uh, now along those lines, though, we are looking at uh, some of the additional modalities, some of the things that are changing in the healthcare environment and how healthcare is applied. Uh, what does that physical built environment look like? Uh, things such as micro hospitals or um, extended care outpatient facilities and specialty outpatient facilities. We've, we've touched upon in the previous slide some of the, the generational issues as far as ger geriatrics, but there are demographics and and generational issues regarding how people want to be receiving their health care. Uh, the generational issues of the differences between generations of the providers and the receivers of care and their expectations. How do all of those pieces fit in? We're at a point, and particularly for the 2022, you can make the argument for the 2018, that we're designing now for the millennials and not the boomers. It's uh, just looking at the time, particularly for new construction, when you take a look at the time that it takes for design and then construction, that we're starting to push into that next, uh, that next bubble of uh, future patients. We have looked at, from the steering committee's point of view and the board point of view, quite a few other topics. Some are, we're building on, so we've had the acoustics group and we're gonna to continue to build upon that. The need for palliative care, <clears throat> palliative care, hospice care, um, how do we address that? What are the baseline? What are the fundamental components that would go into that? Taking a look at the rural health settings and rural health care, and as, as systems change, as com community hospitals become more a part of a larger system, um, does that have an impact on the design and the functionality? What are, what are the functions of those various settings? Um, I touched upon earlier resiliency, business continuity, not just from an IT point of view, but also from that emergency preparedness. And so we're, we're putting some more meat into that as well. Um, some task groups for small group homes, uh, flexibility within acuity, how do you maintain dignity and privacy for our patients as they move through many of these different areas as well. And so the, the really what's next is, uh, is further development of the 2022 guidelines. And you can look on the FGI website for the calendar as to when to start to submit proposals. And I ask that you be innovative in your thoughts. Um, you're closer to the field and so may see some of these things, such as it was people who were close to the field that saw the low acuity pods and brought that forward. So the more, the earlier that can get into the process, get fully developed, uh, then it, it, they stand a chance to be moved into and help define what the built environment will be for the delivery of healthcare moving forward. So look at the calendar, uh, submit proposals, comment on them, it's, it will all be laid out on the FGI guideline. And I think that's pretty much where, we, where we're moving to. Well, very well said, Dana. And uh, just to let the folks know, we're gonna be opening up the proposal period here in the next month or so. And then we're going to also be closing that proposal period sometime in June of 2019. Um, be a part of the process. Don't sit back and wonder, you know, why did something get written the way it it has been written. If it needs to be modified and changed, please, you know, become active, submit your proposals, and uh, let's get the guidelines changed. Doug, Dana, thank you both for that overview of the changes in the 2018 guidelines documents. Uh, it looks like we have time for just a few follow up questions. Uh, first question Why doesn't FGI provide floor plans and diagrams? Uh, Dana, you want me to so, take that, or do you? Well, I'll start, and then you can finish. <laughs> um, so so I've, 
I've been a proponent of doing that um, in some ways, yeah, and part of that goes to you know, what, what wasn't listed in my background is uh, I am a registered electrical engineer, I'm, I'm a degree mechanical engineer, and I'm used to seeing in the National Electric Code, yeah, now granted, that was decades ago, but still it's very memorable in the, the NEC, they, there is a handbook that's provided that does have diagrams in it and other ways to do it. To do to provide the services or to help the understanding. I look at it more as an educational piece, um, but there's a so that's very helpful. But there's a uh, part to it that starts to become is that the only thing? Is it a, is it a cut and paste? I mean, Doug, do you agree with that? Yeah, over the years of working on codes and standards, uh, whether it's NFPA or guidelines or ASHRAE, it's always difficult to come up with what you consider a typical floor plan, room diagram. Uh, it could even be an elevation because as soon as you start putting those types of or that kind of material into a document, you find that the authorities have a jurisdiction kind of tend to say everything has to look like what's in the uh, standard itself. So we really stayed away from including any kind of diagrams within the fundamental documents. Now, that's one of the reasons why we're moving into beyond fundamentals because we do have that opportunity in a beyond fundamental to really put in not only uh, floor plans and elevations and graphics, but even photographs that will help explain what the intent of the document is. So it's, it's more so we don't create what I would hate to do and that is a, a cookie cutter plug and play type of uh, atmosphere around the authority having jurisdiction and what we can and cannot design in healthcare today. Well, we do okay, use thanks. the, and there's the examples that we showed also, we do use that information to help define, uh, to help define the words that go into the guidelines or so, or not define the words, but the, how we actually write and correct the proposals and the, the verbiage within the guidelines. And we, you saw great examples of that with the low acuity and the, the work we did on the <clears throat> patients of size and in the operating rooms, the many pieces that, that uh, show it's very helpful with understanding, but you're right, we don't want to make it, the, as I put it, cut and paste, where it becomes just a way of doing your design in total. Okay, thanks, Dana. You mentioned in the beginning of your presentation a benefit cost analysis. Where can I find that? Um, Heather, the benefit cost analysis is published on the FGI website. And so if you go to the major header called resources, uh, you will find the, uh, the white paper that was produced and all of the great information about uh, how they evaluated and how we did our work in order to come up with the percentages that you saw on that one chart that I provided. Yeah, it may be worthwhile to point out also that uh, even with that background, the, we it, it's difficult to quantify the downstream effects of some of these changes. And so um, yeah, better mortality rates, uh, less infection control rates, it's hard to put numbers to those. But the, as we look at patient safety and the impact of the built environment on that and the delivery of healthcare, uh, it, it really... Yeah, those, those are key components. We're, we're going to continue to look at that, and that's another one of those things looking forward. How can we put some numbers to that? But uh, it really does, we really are conscious of how we're uh, establishing the fundamentals, the baseline, and the positive impacts that can have uh, for our downstream effect as well. Yeah, Dan, and you're right. I didn't mention earlier, but uh, we really are looking at it not only for initial cost, but we are looking at it from a life cycle cost. And that has a huge uh, impact on the percentages because, once again, something may be very expensive to put in initially, but then when you get into operational efficiencies over time, the, uh, the initial cost quickly goes away. All right, I think that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, thanks to both of you very much, our presenters Doug Erickson and Dana Swenson for the presentation. For the viewers, please remember to see the person who registered your site at the close of this session for information on receiving learning units or certificate. 
You must be registered through MADCAD in order to take the survey and obtain credit. Here's a look at the complete webinar series that FGI is offering on the 2018 guidelines for design and construction documents. We hope you'll be able to join us for each presentation. Keep current with what's happening at FGI, including updates on adoption, errata, and the 2022 revision cycle by signing up for our quarterly newsletter, the FGI Bulletin, or following us on LinkedIn.